cholestasis, the liver function test really does not upset us and not much is understood from the liver function test except for a few areas in neonatal cholestasis. Number one is, is the INR abnormal? If it is a correctable INR, then it suggests that this is a extrahepatic cause or it is a less severe intrahepatic cause. But an uncorrectable INR tells you that this neonate is actually in a liver failure. So it's a neonatal liver failure and most likely it is going to be an intrahepatic cause. As I've told you, alkaline phosphatase is not very important in neonates, but a high GGT which suggests biliary atresia, allergy syndrome, or a progressive familial intrahepatic cholestasis type 3. And very importantly, low or normal GGT is the rest of the progressive familial intrahepatic cholestasis that is type 1, type 2, type 4, type 5, and now there's a type 6 also. And also bile acid synthetic defects. So the rest of the markers in LFT in a neonatal uh, cholestasis, which is total bilirubin, albumin, protein and all that, high, low really does not discriminate between any two disorders. The liver function test in neonatal liver failure, very high transaminases would suggest herpes simplex liver failure. And a near normal transaminases with a grossly deranged prothrombin time on INR would suggest either of these two conditions, which is neonatal hemochromatosis, which is a cirrhosis in utero. You will have to read out, read up about it. And or tyrosinemia, which also is an early onset liver failure. Now let's look at some case capsules based on infantile cholestasis. Here is a 64 day old baby who has been noticed to have jaundice from day three of life, diaper staining urine and persistently pale stools from birth. So this tells you that there's a neonatal cholestasis going on in the background. He's not very sick. The birth weight is 3.2 kgs, which is good, respectable weight. No abnormal facies, no dysmorphisms or cataract and you have a firm uh, three centimeter liver and a small spleen. And when the patient gets his LFT done, you realize that the GGT, look here, is 1751. It's very high. Alphos is also high concomitantly, but I told you, Alphos, let's not react much to it in a neonatal cholestasis. Based on this GGT and also the fact that this prothrombin time got corrected with the vitamin K, can we come to a logical conclusion? Yes, we can. We should suspect biliary atresia in such a scenario. And the ultrasound showed a rudimentary gallbladder, which is almost diagnostic of biliary atresia, triangular cord sign, which again suggests you that there is biliary atresia. And a liver biopsy was done, which showed features of biliary atresia, such as bile ductal proliferation. You can see the widening of the portal tract and already serotic uh, pattern that has come in. So here is a case of biliary atresia with pale stools, ultrasound is suggestive, liver biopsy is suggestive and how you diagnose this case was based on the high GGT and correctable INR. But remember only one third of biliary atresia or maybe 50% of biliary atresia cases have this classically high GGT. Some of them may have a normal GGT. A second case is a 90 day old uh, baby who's been noticed to have jaundice from day 18 of life with pigmented stools, low birth weight. It's not very sick. Stools are pigmented. Liver is soft. And if you look at the liver function test, can you make out anything that is abnormal? Well, there is some jaundice which is there. There is some amount of mild to moderate increase in the AST or ALT. Albumin is there, which is 3.4, and the rest of it is near normal. The GGT is 54. The rest of it is not discriminatory. You have a normal ultrasound, a torch profile, alpha ketoprotein, ferritin. And if you look at the liver biopsy, it tells you giant cell transformation, ballooning of hepatocytes. That means there is an 
neonatal hepatitis going on in the background and the diagnosis is idiopathic neonatal hepatitis. Why I showed you this case is for the follow-up and not for the diagnosis. Look at the follow-up. As the patient is improving on his own and we are not giving much here, we are not doing much here. This is an idiopathic neonatal hepatitis which resolves on its own. The splenomegaly went, the bilirubin normalized, the hepatomegaly went and look at it in the final parts of this case. That means by one year almost, the transaminases have also resolved on its own. Hence, follow-up in this case is telling you that the LFT is resolving and the diagnosis is truly idiopathic neonatal hepatitis. Look at this case. This is a 37-day-old baby who has come with pigmented stools and jaundice. Birth weight is low and there is seizures that are occurring, which is not a very good thing. And the patient has recovered from a very stormy neonatal course requiring ventilation, necrotizing enterocolitis, lots of things have gone on. So you would immediately think that this patient is in sepsis. But how long can sepsis go on? Sepsis can't go on forever. So is there any underlying condition in this patient? The patient is sick and look here. He has skin bleeds, hypoglycemia and has now developed ascites, which is very, very important. In sepsis, ascites does not just develop on their own. So in this scenario, you have to suspect those diseases which can cause neonatal liver failure. And if you look at it very closely, you will see that in the total bil in, in the LFT, the total bilirubin and direct bilirubin are very high. Yeah. And the albumin is 2.8, which is low. But again, in an acute condition, we are not going to interpret too much. And the prothrombin time is not correctable. This is a case of neonatal liver failure, right? So what could this be? The ultrasound is normal and the urine non-glucose reducing substances are positive. And we immediately think, the most treatable condition which is galactosemia and yes the galliput enzyme in the RBC is undetectable. So this is a case of galactosemia with an underlying sepsis and the importance of showing you this case is to pick up the uncorrectable coagulopathy in this patient. Another clue that you had from this case also is when an eye examination was done there was a cataract in the eye. So be very careful when you're diagnosing just neonatal sepsis. Are you missing out? Galactosemia is very important. The prothrombin time uncorrectable. Ascites and a cataract may give you the clue. Now let's look at a five-year-old girl who had jaundice from infancy. She developed pruritus by the fourth year. It started insidiously by the first year and went on increasing uh, till the fourth year, till the patient came to us. And uh, initially when an LFT was done on the third year, it was found that the GGT is on the lower side. And when she reached us, here also we saw that there is a hepatosplenomegaly, yes, that is there. And then there is a GGT again, which is on the lower side. So what could this be? This looks like a progressive familial intrahepatic cholestasis types 1, 2, 4, 5 or 6. 4, 5 or 6 are very rare. So 1 and 2 will consider primarily. This pruritus came down with arsoduoxycholic acid and rifampicin. But on follow-up when the patient has become clinically better, still the GGT continues to be low because this is a problem of BLD excretion this GGT will never normalize and a follow-up of this patient will tell you that the liver function test, though the total bilirubin and albumin have improved, the GGT will continue to remain low. And this is a case of progressive familial intrahepatic cholestasis type 1. We did a genetic test and the clues from this case is an early onset cholestasis from infancy, pruritus, organomegaly, and there is a persistently low gamma glutamyl transpeptidase.
The mutation in PFIC1 is ATP8B1. Now let's look at liver function tests in acute liver conditions and these are some case capsules. Here is a 10 year old boy who had a prodrome of 10 days and developed jaundice and this jaundice in the early, earlier part that bilirubin was 2.5 only but the transaminases are in thousands so that is a severe liver injury and this jaundice at the 10th